All I'm just saying is realize that God loves you. If you realize that God loves you, you have everything. Your whole life is transformed. You are accelerating into the glory at the most incredible rate. You're there instantly. You're, I mean, it's, it's enlightenment. It's whatever you call it. You suddenly realize, God loves me. That's everything taken off my shoulders, every burden every conceivable burden. Do you see, if I gain 80% of something that's eternal, I've gained still eternal, the eternal. And that in the limit means, do you mean infinitely small amount of the eternal is still the eternal? And the answer is yes. O ye of little faith, that is all faith because it's a part of the eternal. So our hope, our imagination, our faith, our trust is in the infinite. And it's that extraordinary embrace, that extraordinary taking hold of, which is infinity. The very presence of God himself in you and through you If God didn't exist, even, that would have brought about his eternal existence. Do you see you're a child of God? You, that self-creativity, that initial foundational cause, is what we are. We are children of God. We are of the same lineage, the same genetic makeup, we have this incredible capacity to choose our own existence. Wow. What caused us to have that? Well, only itself, of course. God. And I don't mean we're now pushing him aside. I mean somewhere in the system there is life. And because of it we are given life. And that is our, our handle on this dream that transfers it, translates us into an eternal reality, infinitely good. That is our capacity born in us of God. We are children of God. And to say children of God is to communicate to you that all power is, so to speak, in a being that loves you as you are as a being, is a being like you and has caused you to come into being and is present with you always and loves you, wants your welfare and will have it. Fantastic, you see. Thank you. I must continue. What I've got to get my girl. Thank you, Heavenly Father. It's self-created. The goal is what I've defined to be good and to find to be what I will find to be good ultimately that is good in some ultimate sense that exists as some pure type in the spiritual realm, a conception, an imagination. And I'm not even saying what that imagination is other than the fact it is whatever would be that is truly Wonderful, perfect, right, eternal, glorious, good in all the ways that even will always be and should, in some sense, whatever that means, always be. It's, do you see, it's a self creative thing. I'm actually saying, giving allegiance mentally to something which is defined to be right and what we mean by right. 
what is meant by right. I know it's going to be circular, ultimately. I suspect, Rupp, a bit like logic, it does all depend on accepting one axiom. Well, at some point, your desire is to accept some axiom, and our desire is that God be. And that is the all of it. Thank you, Heavenly Father. There is a peace then in optimizing what is God's guidance to you, and intuition, if you like, direct from the mind of God. So even when you're rushing, you're slowing down in order to track what's God got here, what's the priority. Am I achieving what is absolutely necessary in the now? Um, have I got it, in which case I'm doing it, the volition is there, or am I still seeking it, in which case I'm still optimizing the things around me so that I feel God's presence, his direction, his leading. In other words, I'm seeking not a crowded optimization problem situation, but an absolute peace of receiving the right guidance to what needs truly to be guided. I'm seeking a presence of mind that is the awareness of him. And I mean it even, I think, in its ambiguity. Not just my awareness of him, but his awareness of me is what I'm holding. Do you see, to be filled with the devotion to this loveliness of God being the most incredibly benevolent being that we're epitomizing, at least in the Jesus story, as our Heavenly Father, to be holding that as the faith and the trust that you choose to hold to is everything, to your peace, to your welfare, to your achieving and pursuing goodness, whatever that ultimately is found to be, and is found. Praise God. Thank you, Heavenly Father. My wife just appeared with child. Hang on a moment. My ex-wife. Yes. Mm. Thank you, Father. If I may add a note here, two years later, it's January, um, no, it's February. February the Sixth. We are not of this world, this cosmos, of uncertainty, time, space, matter, and so forth, scarcity. We are here for an experience. What we are is, if you like, the nature of a prime mover in dimensions that are not this. And we are visiting here for this stage performance. We therefore appear here as prime movers. There is nothing here that is causing us. We are the cause of here. Because we're all persons. This is the fantastic nature of a person. It's not describable in terms of this um, this cosmos, this dimension, this, this universe. We are all, each of us, playing a part in this play, and it's part of the training for each of us. In other words, it's a blessing for each of us. The whole thing is a wonderful blessing, even for those watching. The rest of the hosts of heaven that wish to watch, that are um, not actually involved in this, including our Heavenly Father. It's, it's, it's not rational to say what has caused this environment we're in, in terms of the environment that we're in. 
only in terms of the environment that caused it. You know, if you were a potter, you would understand how he came to be making the pot. But if you're the pot, you cannot understand that. Because you're simply in a storehouse of pots, or a kitchen that's in which they're used from time to time. This theatre, cosmos, is, is used continuously. All sorts of performances are here. Everything's transitory. It's all a performance. <laughs> it has meaning in that it has consequence for the kingdom of heaven, that which is in which the cosmos is contained, that beyond. The cosmos and we, we here in it are as in the outside, beyond the garden. with limitations, as defined by the nature of that which is without, outside the garden, so to speak, the cosmos, which is actually inside the bounds of, if you like, heaven, in terms of heaven's dimensions which is not in terms of what the cosmos's dimensions are. When you realize it, you can change the play any time you wish. But if you realized it, you would probably therefore also be in realization of the purpose for which the play is being played, and therefore you won't alter it, because it's, if you like, communally, divinely um, purposed to be a blessing to each of us, and a blessing to each of us it is. That doesn't mean to say you're experiencing the rewards of such lesson at the moment. <laughs> you may be finding it extremely hard going. But in some sense, you knew this before we took up the performance. You're here most willingly albeit without the consciousness of such. Now, if you have the consciousness of such, well, this makes this play an epic performance. Because each of the players now plays their role, but in novel circumstance. And they're all learning the more from it. And it is a creation. It's not something that's already been thought through. The play is therefore not preordained, only the production, the performance. The content is not. The purpose is certainly pre-purposed. And it will attain that purpose because each of the players has noble purpose outside of the roles that they've committed themselves to play. <laughs> so from heaven's point of view, you can say, oh, that's wonderfully played, that character even though his character in the play is of a villain. But it's not a villain that actually hurts the hero, say, or the heroine. Only one that seems to purport to, for the sake of the play. Now, anyone who is enlightened, who's in the play, no way it's going to spoil the purpose of the play. But bringing his enlightenment into the actual play makes the play far more enlightening and entertaining. 
because his role is not preset, whereas their roles are. <laughs> it's just that <laughs> they've got to ad lib their role and their lines as the play develops now, because it's not developing according to some preset plan. It departs from it to the extent that the enlightened ones tweak the performance. So Jesus in the story doesn't ram the truth down your throat. It says, those that have ears to hear, let them hear. Oh my goodness, that's wildfire. One or two do choose to hear in the context of the play, of course. And so they have to adjust their role according to this new aspect being presented by the enlightened one. But to return to the usual question of, well, how did it all come about, all this play, this cosmos, well, what's the cause of the cosmos? Well, you're not going to find out in terms of the cosmos itself. You'd need to understand um, the garden, uh, heaven. And that is a phenomenon that utterly dwarfs any interest you might have in what causes the cosmos. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Look, it's a story. It's all a story. Even the explanations are stories. It's a parable of parables. Quite simply, it's a lesson that we're here to learn and be blessed by. That is our trust. Why do we choose to trust this? Because it would be blatantly pointless to trust anything else. Besides, look how much happier it makes us trusting such. Neither you nor I know that we are right. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And bless you. Thank you, Dad.